and I'm a professor in mechanical and aerospace. You're all 117 students, yeah? Yep, yep. Congratulations. And what, who's going to do mechanical engineering? Yeah. Well, who's going to do something else? Yeah, good, good. Diversity is what we want. Okay, so I, don't, I didn't want to sort of continue something that Professor Rowena was talking about in, in context because I thought it would be best for him to have the continuity. So what I've decided just to do is give a little separate class on engineering uh, ethics. And uh, so it's a self-contained unit of this course, entirely appropriate to do, be doing it into a, in, in an introductory course on, on uh, engineering because engineering ethics is a really an important subject in its own right. And who's up on the left there? Very ethical looking person, looking straight at you, very clear, contemplative. And who is this on the bottom? That's Bertie Madoff, who's in jail now for unethical behavior, looking down, uh, you know, and he has nice green trees behind him. He has a stone wall behind him. So there we are. Okay. So ethics and morals are used equally. You can go to the philosophy department and you can do uh, a whole uh, PhD as well as undergraduate on ethics and, and moral behavior. So I'm not going to propose to, to get into the whole discussion, excepting to use the normal, uh, the normal uh, uh, way we talk about ethical behavior, moral behavior, unethical behavior, immoral behavior. And, uh, and just to remind you that, uh, um, that ethical codes, um, that ethics and, uh, uh, and law are sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, divorced from each other, particularly when we go to different countries. Um, uh, we, we would regard some laws in other countries as being unethical, to chop off people's hands, for example, if they've done a crime, and yet others would, require, would believe what we're doing in this country as being unethical, for example, of, uh, of capital punishment and so on. And so there are the, the notion of law and ethics are uh, a separate, uh, uh, separate pr uh, problems, and I'll come back to that a little bit at the end, uh, a little bit later in the, t in a, in the talk. By the way, um, please interrupt me uh, and ask me questions as I go along. I'm very happy for you to do that. Okay, so um, let me start a little bit by uh, uh, talking about uh, behavior, ethical uh, behavior in terms of, of moral, the moral uh, position that an engineer might find him or herself in and then uh, something that is very dear to my heart now and indeed becomes very important for us all and that is the environmental aspects of engineering which is really becoming one of the major major issues of, of our time but uh, so I've just put up a few things that I want you to think about and maybe again if we have time at the end of the course we can talk about them that that all of you will have choices when you finish your uh, degree about working on particular, particular topics. You'll have a leaning towards something. Some of you might want to be an aerospace engineer. Some of you might want to work on, on, uh, on uh, materials or something like that. But you'll also have some choice on the actual subject that you'll work uh, on. And, uh, and I've just put a few extreme examples uh, about asking the ethical and moral questions. What is it right to work on? So few, few people, I think, would argue that it's unethical to work on prostheses to help people that have disabilities. Uh, uh, fewer, but not all, would argue that working on a bridge is unethical, but some might look at a particular bridge and say it's unethical to work on it because it's doing a bridge between uh, it's going to muck up some social aspects of two communities or something like that or produ produce more pollution or something like that but still few would, would, would see this as being fairly neutral from an ethical viewpoint working on a rocket becomes a little bit more a uh, little bit more uh, 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 complex because rockets can deliver 
good things like uh, communication satellites <coughs> and bad things such as uh, uh, ICBMs and you might, uh, such as ballistic missiles and you might uh, feel a, a conscience, uh, an ethical conscience uh, about working on, on, a, on a rocket. When we come to a machine gun, it's even clearer. A machine gun, others, some would argue that, you know, we have to have weapons of war and, uh, and therefore uh, 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 I'm happy to work on them. Others would say, these are killing people and I'm not interested in making, I don't think it's ethical to make machines that kill people and they may be, uh, 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 see that as a, as a dividing line here. And very few would, I hope none, I'm sure none of you would, would think of working out uh, on something that would just exterminate innocent people such as the Nazi uh, uh, gas chambers. But in fact, engineers with bachelor's degrees worked on these things in Nazi Germany. And it's something that we always have to uh, be aware of. And so there's a whole variation in the type of engineering that you can do. And you can choose to do that from a, an ethical, uh, uh, you can look at these in terms of an ethical position. And it's something I think is very important to uh, to think about. The, uh, and you can think of other examples, of course. There are lots of other examples uh, um, uh, that you can think of. Um, I mean, there are examples, actually, of neutral activities that you might think are unethical uh, 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 to work on, that although they are not bad or good in some sense, uh, they have complications that, uh, that may make them uh, unethical to use. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, possibilities. Um, again, from the environmental side, um, I think few, and I'm ready to have discussion on this, few would argue that working on a wind uh, turbine is bad from an environmental viewpoint. But some would. They would say, look, it's going to wreck the, uh, uh, it's going to wreck uh, uh, the land in that region and nature in that region or perhaps the aesthetics of that region. There have been a lot of people that have fought against uh, wind turbines and ethical considerations have come into their discussion. But most would think that it's ethically, it's ethically sound to work on something like a wind turbine or indeed a hybrid car, uh, a hybrid car which uh, typically can get 50 miles to the gallon is, uh, is, is less damaging to the environment than a, uh, um, a, a, a gas guzzler that can get, say, 12 or 15 miles to the gallon. And because we have this environmental crisis that we're living through, and all of you are going to be living through, uh, then it becomes an interesting ethical problem of whether you would be wanting to, to design and work on a car like that. And of course, many of you will go into automobile uh, industry uh, uh, when you finish your, uh, finish your degree. Um, how much carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere every time you burn a gallon of gas? Does anybody know? Pardon? How many pounds of carbon dioxide or kilograms? About 20 pounds, every time you burn a gallon of gas, about 20 pounds of carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, lifetime of order of 100 years. So if you go, you know, so 20 pounds per gallon, you go back for Thanksgiving to New York in your car, say, uh, it's uh, 250 miles, so you get, you know, 30 miles to the gallon, it's eight, eight gallons. Eight, eight, eight twos, 160 pounds. Your weight would go into the into the atmosphere. Just one uh, trip to go, uh, to New York. Your weight, your total weight, or your total mass would go into the atmosphere. And that has a lifetime of about of about 100 years. So we and and as you know, that carbon dioxide is producing uh, a global climate change. So these become environmental ethical issues of of working on. And similarly, for coal powered plants. There are a lot of ethical issues uh, uh, related to working on a coal power plant. Um, and uh, um, <coughs> pollution, carbon dioxide uh, are the two, two uh, main ones. And also there are ethical issues in, in the way they are affecting the local environment as well. And then 
beef production plants, again, there are other ethical issues about the way uh, um, cattle raising is, is affecting the environment and, uh, and uh, um, also uh, some will have ethical issues about uh, humane, uh, uh, humane uh, ways of, uh, of killing animals and so on and bringing animals up and animal farming versus anim animal industry and so on and so forth. So these, these are uh, issues that, uh, that would be, uh, that are very, uh, becoming extremely important now to think about uh, for the future generation of engineers. Um, let me remind you that engineering is a, a social experiment, that, that in some sense all of us, you know, we, we are depending on progress for our, uh, we're all in a profession that when you go out and either become a professor and do research or work in industry, most of you are trying to progress some, something in some direction. Pro progressing knowledge or progressing ideas, making inventions and so on. And as these inventions come into the, into the marketplace, they change the society we live in. And they change it in ways that are hitherto unpredictable. And so, in some sense, when we think of what we're doing, we're doing a massive social experiment. And here, here is a, you know, a vacuum tube. When I was a little kid, a radio ran on these big vacuum tubes. And it, you turn on a radio, and it took about three minutes for it to warm up. And uh, uh, that was it. And people had tried to make computers out of vacuum tubes, uh, and the computer that you could make out of a vacuum tube had far more less uh, computing power than the cell phone. Uh, uh, and that was the biggest computers in the world at that point. Um, in fact, the computing power of the Apollo 11 mission to the moon in 1969, this, you're, you're, you don't remember, but you've read that, that we put uh, men on the moon in 1969 with this fantastic uh, 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 rocket that went up uh, and circled the moon and then, then landed on the moon. The computing power available at that time was less than the computing power in a, uh, in a uh, cell phone. Uh, and nobody could predict what was going to happen. Uh, and so I've got, you know, the first transistor, first transistor integrated circuits and then all of this stuff that, and this is a, just a pile of disused uh, uh, cell phones lying there. So nobody could have predicted where, with the inve invention of the valve and then the invention of the transistor, uh, transistor sorry, and the integrated circuit, what would be result from it? And indeed, a lot of good has resulted uh, from it, mostly good. Uh, and, uh, for example, example, these students are diligently taking notes of my lecture as I'm talking. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but there have been a lot of other fantastic things, uh, much better communication between countries, between peoples of countries, much better ways of gaining knowledge and so on and so forth, and some bad things too. But we never can predict uh, uh, what is going to happen, and we would surely not want to say, ha, huh, I've made a new invention, let's set up some governing board of people to decide whether we should go, ag go ahead in marketing it, because predicting what will happen is difficult. It's very, very difficult. But let me, let me compare it to some other, other professions. Okay, so here is another e example of engineering being a social experiment. When the first cars were developed, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, a few cars were running around the streets. There was very little law. It was a novelty. I was reading uh, the New York Times, for example, sometimes publishes uh, uh, on the back of the first section the front page of the New York Times from 100 years ago. And I was reading it, it the other day, and it had on the front page of the New York Times a little column, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Smith, I forget their names, uh, were run over by an automobile on Broadway today and they've gone to the hospital and they're going to be all right. This was the front page of the New York Times a hundred years ago. No such things would have not been reported where 40,000 people are getting killed on the road uh, each year and, uh, and uh, even 
so, so these things are not reported. The whole projection of the, this to this to people having respiratory uh, diseases living near highways was something that could not have been uh, uh, could not have been predicted. And of course, it's not only things like this, but it's also pollution and again uh, uh, global warming. So. Um, but nevertheless, this is our invention. The, this, this sprang from the work of, of, of Otto and Diesel, uh, and, uh, and it's something that we've, uh, we, as engineers, have developed. But we cannot, it's very, very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And if you think of new inventions now, some will really develop and some will atrophy. So physics too, as, as you know, can be a social experiment. Here is the uh, Rutherford with the, his, his, uh, his gold foil experiment in, in, in the early part of the uh, 20th century and 40 years later you have uh, an atom bomb and you have massive, massive destruction and, 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 uh, and uh, death uh, of, of hundreds of thousands of people. And again, so that's a, another thing that it's very, very hard to predict. What, what is going to come out of invention. Now, medicine also is a social uh, uh, experiment, but with medicine, we're very much more careful. And uh, uh, every time we get a new, a new vaccine or a new medicine, it has to go through an enormous amount of drug trials and tests and so on to see that it's safe to give. And we should be thankful for, <laughs> that we do that. And sometimes it's, it, we get it right and we stop uh, stuff from, uh, from getting through, as it were. And other times, we get it uh, wrong. Um, in a, in a, for example, I can think of an example in the United States uh, when thalidomide, which was, a, I believe, used as a sleeping drug, was invented. And uh, it uh, uh, was used widely uh, and pregnant women uh, uh, took it and had children with severely atrophied uh, uh, limbs. This was in the, I think, in the in the 60s. And uh, and and uh, but in America, it was refused by the the FDA. It didn't pass the test by the FDA. And we have very we don't have any children or or now adults that are affected by thalidomide. So that, that's a very good example of uh, working through trials, working through. Uh, the fact that the drug not, may not be uh, uh, good, and then uh, and then prohibiting it. Now it's sort of interesting to conjecture whether you could do something like that with engineering, and and it's very very hard to do that for the reasons that I've just uh, just outlined, and that is that it's that it's very very hard to predict what use is going to be made out of something, and very often it's both good and bad comes out of out of things. So so. Uh, um, out of the nuclear, the developments of the Manhattan Project that developed the first nuclear uh, weapons came nuclear power, which can be a very, very important, play an important role in, uh, in, in uh, future energy needs because it's a non-carbon uh, non uh, uh, way of producing uh, uh, power. And at the same time, it created atom bombs. But it's so hard to predict uh, which way uh, uh, technology and science is going to move. Um, another, another aspect where I think ethics is going to play, play a much, much more important role in the, is, is in, in obsolescence. And we all now, we all have computers and uh, electronic devices and within What's the lifetime of, well, you're too young still to know. You, most of you are still probably on your first uh, computer. But, but uh, typically, the lifetime of a computer is around five, five years, if you're using it fairly intensively. It doesn't break, but it becomes a memory, doesn't, uh, is not uh, big enough, and, and, uh, and so on. And, and new aspects are invented, and so on. And uh, what you do is it becomes obsolete. Not, not unworkable, but it just becomes obsolete. Uh, I've got a pair of boots here uh, that, that planned obsolescence is not built into, a, it wasn't at least, uh, uh, built into, 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 into a pair of boots and, and people would wear boots for many, many, many years 
uh, and until they literally fell, fell to pieces. But now, um, the question is whether it is morally acceptable to build in planned obsolescence under the conditions that we, we live in. And uh, this is another aspect of, of engineering that you, uh, another aspect of being an engineer that you're going to have to be very, very uh, aware of, that this is the population of the world from 10,000 before the common era up until, up until uh, uh, till, uh, till now. And you can see the exponential rise. And if you look at this, uh, if you look at this graph here at the bottom, it's rather interesting that, that the population in billions, the first time it got to one billion people, these are estimates, was in about 1800. Okay? Then the next, the next um, was 1927 to get to 2 billion, and 1950 to get to 3 billion. And then, 1974 and so on, uh, 1999 to 6 billion, but uh, 2012 to 7 billion. So when I was young, the population of the world was about half of what it is now. This is massive changes that are occurring. And uh, it, it is a, uh, it's a finite world that we live in with a very, very thin envelope that we live in. If you think of it, we can we, we live on in this at, the atmosphere of the of the Earth is around um, five kilometers deep that we can live in. Then it, the air gets too thin, roughly, to to, to be uh, usable, and we don't go very deep below the surface. So we have this very very thin envelope that we uh, can live in, and we're in, we're increasing uh, the population at a great rate. And the question is, how do we, how do we do engineering in a uh, in a world that is is finite, that is is uh, uh, and and uh, we ha we're polluting the atmosphere and we're creating a lot of a lot of uh, um, devices that that are, that become obsolete, and we've got to work out how to do that. And many of you will start thinking about doing. Uh, uh, what's called um, life cycle assessment of products so that they have zero net imprint uh, through their whole life cycle so that you can completely recycle something they, uh, like an automobile either the plastics can be used again and the steel can be used again etc uh, etc et uh, it's called cradle to cradle assessment and, and, uh, and we're going to have to go and move more and more to, to having zero net uh, uh, effect on the environment in the design of our devices. Um, and the other thing is that, that, that in, in designing, in design work, we have to also realize that the, that the Earth system is part of our engineering system. Again, 50 years ago we thought of the the Earth as being infinite in, it, in, in, in its size. The atmosphere was infinite. We could put as much carbon dioxide and anything into it and we thought it would have no or little effect. Now we know that we're affecting it. So we live in a, in a finite system, not an infinite system. And, 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 but, but it's only recent in human history that we've realized that it's a finite system. And you'll deal with systems when you deal with thermodynamics and, and other subjects as you go along. Okay, so um, of course the the engineering uh, engineers are well uh, aware of ethical uh, ethic, ethical aspects. Here's the ASME code of ethics, and uh, it's a little bit boilerplatey, but it's worth going uh, through. That engineers uphold and advance the integrity, honor, and dignity of the engineering profession by using their knowledge and skill for the enhancement of human welfare. So there's this notion that your skills should be used for, uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 developing human welfare. Being honest and impartial and serving uh, with fidelity the public, their employers and clients, and striving to increase the complete uh, uh, competence and prestige of the engineering professions. It's a little bit boilerplate -ish, if you know what I mean. It's a little bit of a, something that could be said about any 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 profession or any activity. 
engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health and welfare of the public in the performance of their professional duties. Now obviously when you see that, you think immediately of not making a device that blows up in somebody's face or a toy that is de defective or a machine that has unusual uh, 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 odors that can be damaging that are, that are, or, or uses compounds that if the machine breaks uh, can escape into the atmosphere and affect the user and so on and so forth. But um, we now have to, again, I'm dwelling on this on purpose, we have to think of the engineer also affecting the health welfare of the public uh, and the safety in terms of designing automobiles that are uh, spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, these are or also affecting our health by causing global climate change. Uh, 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 so the, this part becomes part of the fundamental canon of engineering. Now, engineers shall perform services only in their areas of competence is, a, again, a very interesting and in some ways contentious uh, part of, of, of engineering is what is your, where does that level of competence finish and your level of incompetence start is very hard to say sometimes and some people will hide behind uh, uh, issues by saying I'm not competent to, to, to comment on it and others will be incompetent in certain issues and comment on it. So it's a pretty important thing to think about this but it's pretty hard to, to define it. Engineers shall continue their professional development throughout their careers and shall provide opportunities for the professional uh, development of, the, of these uh, uh, of, of uh, those engineers under their supervision. This is a recognition that, that engineering is a profession which is changing all the time. All professions are like that, and, and uh, indeed more and more so. And one of the arguments, uh, you know, one of the important things of being a student in these days is to realize that uh, you're not here to get hard facts and so on. You're here to learn how to learn, in a sense. And uh, uh, um, uh, students come to me sometimes and say, you know, I want to be this sort of engineer and I can't fit in, you know, I want to be an aerospace engineer, but I can't fit in aerospace structures as a senior, you know, what am I going to do? And I tell them it doesn't matter at all because uh, if you want to be an aero engineer and do aerospace structures, you'll go to a company and you'll learn about those details very, very quickly uh, in the first few weeks even of, 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 your, of your job. The objective in, in what we're trying to do uh, as educators of you as, as young engineers is really to teach you how to think logically and quantitatively and critically about uh, engineering type uh, and, uh, problems. So it's not, it's not to teach you the facts of the profession and nobody will ever come out of a bachelor's degree being a competent aerospace engineer or a com com competent electrical uh, or electronic engineer. Um, these are things that are developed later on. Um, engineers shall uh, shall act in, pro in professional manners for each employer or client as faithful agents or, or, or trustees and shall avoid conflicts of interest. Again, a whole area of discussion can be uh, built around that, the whole thing of conflict of interest. Engineers shall uh, build their professional uh, reputation on the merit of their services and shall not compete unfairly with others. Also, again, these are very, very important aspects. Uh, engineers shall associate only with reputable persons or organizations. Engineers shall uh, issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. And again, that's, that last uh, sentence is a very complicated uh, thing to uh, talk about because it's very hard to really realize what objective, uh, objectivity is. Nearly all of us have opinions as well as scientific knowledge about something and being objective about talking about something such as global warming or whether we should be building a supersonic transport or whether we should be uh, flying a mission to Mars or whether we should be developing a certain uh, product is being objective about it is really very, very difficult because we all come with prejudices and, 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 and personal viewpoints. Okay, um, I'm not hearing any comments or questions. Are there any questions or comments so far? Objections? Okay, um, 
the other thing is there's, a, there's some other, other aspects to engineering that are really interesting, uh, to, to, to the ethical side of engineering that are really interesting. Um, one of the interesting parts is, is what's called whistleblowing. And uh, the, the, you know, the prime example, perhaps, of this is the, is the Challenger space shuttle, which in 1986 took off and blew up uh, 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 around about a minute, I think, after launch. And of, uh, seven uh, astronauts, in, including a school teacher, uh, were, were killed on that mission. And it was the first of the shuttle missions to, to fail. That we've had two failures, and uh, um, it was a, a, a you know a terrible disaster. And uh, it was a, it really is one of the most interesting cases because um, an engineer or oh, more than one engineer, but he's the one that's, that's particularly well known, Ros Ros Roger Bo <coughs> Bo Boys Jolly, uh, was knew that there was a real defect in, in the design of the O-rings in the fuel tanks of the shuttle. And he was warning all the time that if the launch pl took place uh, under conditions that were uh, too cold, then the O-ring the rubber o-ring would, or I think it's a rubber compound, would, uh, would uh, contract and there would be leaking of fuel and that fl fuel would, would, uh, could then potentially explode. And he warned his supervisors, here he is here, as, as, uh, as an engineer here um, in the, in, in the, uh, the, under the organization chart of Morton uh, Tharkol. And he warned in a letter written in in July of 85, it blew up in, in, in the launch of, of January 86, um, saying it is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem with the, f uh, with the field uh, joint uh, having, I'm sorry, with, with the, the field joint having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with the launch uh, pad facilities. So he was very convinced that the design was poor and he alerted his seniors to it and the seniors overrode him. The seniors in the, uh, in the um, administrative side overrode him and decided to go ahead with the launch in January and it was a very cold morning. These, these engineers knew what would happen and indeed, moments after this uh, uh, terrible event occurred, uh, it was known that it was the O-rings. In fact, it was a complicated combination of O-rings and a slight bit of shear in, in, in the wind that did it. And uh, it caused a tre tremendous uh, 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 self-examination of the way organizations work and what is the role of the engineer in, in an organization and what is the role of the administration and how should they be uh, connected to, uh, to each other and uh, one of the things they found out that there was a tr it was terribly disjoint the difference between the engineers and the administration but the thing about whistleblowing is it, it's it's it, it's a terribly important thing it's hard to to uh, to go to bed with a, a clear conscience uh, if you see something like this happening and you don't blow the whistle but there's also tremendous impedance towards you doing, blowing the whistle, because it, 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 you have to be very, very courageous to do it. And it looks after the event, he's a, he's a hero, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the more typical fate of a whistleblower is to be sidelined in promotions and sometimes to lose, uh, lose your job. And uh, uh, so this is something that becomes a real important and an interesting moral uh, dilemma of the engineer. This is an extreme case, but there are many, many other cases that are less extreme and therefore even stickier to deal with that could be so something to do with the environmental aspect or a safety ac aspect that could be bad or could just cause a little bit of injury and so on and so forth. And there you're set into a moral dilemma. Very often these things are worked out. You go and talk to your supervisor or, or the administration and you discuss it and there's an understanding that it can be worked out but sometimes it's not. They say no we've got to get this product out very very quickly and, uh, and uh, profits are here and we've got competition. This was by the way exactly the case here. There was tremendous uh, reason why they wanted this uh, to, uh, 
to go off, that there, the, a number of other flights had been cancelled. Apparently, President <coughs> Reagan, who was then the president, uh, 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 was conscious of the fact that it was going to go up. And there was a school teacher. There was a lot of publicity for it. Uh, and, uh, and so that there was a lot of pr pressure to launch. And the, the whistleblower was over, over, overridden. Uh, so these are these are very complicated issues that again that you will uh, will have to deal with, and it's not only a project like rockets. This is a civil engineering pro project, the Great Alaska uh, Pipeline, um, which uh, was uh, were built in the 70s, um, and again many would argue that its its benefits have been much greater than its uh, deficits, but on the other hand. Uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, natural uh, uh, destruction caused by this uh, 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 because uh, the Exxon Valdez and, and, and other accidents have occurred causing uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, destruction of nature. And again, there's a balance that we have to work out and discuss. And this is a going on all the time. And in fact, as we stand here now, there's this big discussion of whether we'll have hydro uh, fracturing uh, of, 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 uh, of the shale in this region uh, to produce natural gas. And that's a ma that you pump fluids down into the rock uh, to cause high pressure and then release natural gas. And in doing that, you can affect the groundwater. And so very, even in the paper, the Ithaca Times this morning, there's a discussion of whether we should allow it or we shouldn't. Expert knowledge will be caused, call, called in. Engineers from Cornell will presumably have to weigh in on this uh, subject. And you have to weigh in between the benefits of having the, having the, uh, the, the natural gas, uh, which is, by the way, around half the, uh, uh, it produces uh, uh, about half the carbon dioxide per unit of energy than, than coal does, and at the same time, whether we're going to pollute um, uh, the water supply and so on. So these are issues all the time that, that have to be uh, discussed. Um, so let me, let me uh, uh, sort of start to finish off by saying that there is a... There is a, a a lot, of, a lot of interesting ethical dilemmas that occur uh, uh, to the engineer, that all of us bring a personal ethical viewpoint into, into our engineering. All of us come from different backgrounds. All of us, some of us are liberal and some of us are conservative and some people come from one religion, some come from another, some are non-religious, some are very religious, some come from different cultures and so on and so forth. And each of us have got a, a, personal, a personal ethical v viewpoint. None of us, not one of us, have identical ethical viewpoints in this class, I can assure you. Everybody's got to do. We agree broadly on a lot of ethical positions, but on more subtle things, uh, we, we, we will disagree with each other. And yet, when you go into a workplace, there is an ethical uh, um, behavior, an ethical conduct that is assumed uh, in, in both the way the job is performed and the purpose of the job itself. There's ethics associated with what is created in the job. Um, and these two things are often, uh, can, can, can sometimes con can be in conflict. Um, uh, so the, your ethical ca compatibility with that of the workplace is a complicated, uh, a complicated aspect. Moreover, it can change as you go into a job. So you can go into a job and think that that job is ethically uh, uh, um, something that suits you uh, very well, for example, I'm just thinking of examples, that you might go to, to uh, General Electric to work on windmills, they're now one of the largest uh, wind turbine manufacturers, and you'll be good at your job, and then General Re Le Electric will say at some point, oh, we're going to transfer you to our, our <coughs> missile uh, division or whatever. <coughs> And you might be averse to working on missiles, and so it, we, even within a job, there is an evolution of uh, you, the, 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 your, your job description can change and sometimes come into conflict with your uh, ethics. And finally, there's the personal security and, uh, uh, and moral values uh, um, that if you um, uh, Many of you will have engineering jobs and have a family, a wife and a husband and, and uh, some uh, children and there you are, you'll have an ethical conflict at some point 
with the with the uh, with the uh, your employer, but at the same time you've got an ethical obligation to supporting to your, your own family, and 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 uh, and so you have to weigh these things against each other. So you can't be. It's easier to be very uprighteous and ethical uh, uh, when you when you're young and free, but if you have uh, family obligations and other obligations, then there has to be some thinking out about uh, what you can do. And so these have become very, very interesting and <coughs> complicated things to deal with. <coughs> so let me summarize this very, very broad lecture uh, um, by saying that engineers are a combination. We're professionals and people. And these two things uh, uh, are interfacing and making, it, uh, making the, and these interfaces are sometimes not as comfortable as we would like. Uh, we have obligations as individuals to each other and to the environment. That engineering is, uh, in a way, a social experiment, and I think we're going to have to anticipate more and more uh, uh, about the, the results and the effects of what we do on, on the environment and on other people. That we've got to start be thinking about plant obsolescence in a finite world. As I said before, sometimes job satisfaction interferes with moral obligations. Um, we've got a, a lot of your, in, your education will be, even next year when you do engineering design, uh, you'll be in this, this problem of working as an, as an individual in a, in a group and there are a whole lot of uh, interesting dynamical changes that occur uh, when you go from an individual mentality to a group uh, uh, mentality. Some things I haven't even talked about uh, that are terribly important, and usually, uh, you know, when you have a more traditional lecture than mine on engineering e e ethics, this would be one of the main things. Plagiarism, uh, and uh, 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 for example, is, uh, is uh, both as being students as well as being a professional is a terribly important s subject to... Uh, 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 to deal with. Um, as I've said, that there is a code of professional ethics, but it's not very, very detailed. It's a rather boilerplate code. And it, it looking, that, looking up the code of ethics before you have to make a decision in your profession, be it as an academic or as a, as a, uh, 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 as a professional engineer, will not help very much. On the other hand, uh, discussing and talking to people that, that deal with ethics uh, can, uh, can often be very, very useful. And indeed, there are, there are lots of papers written on, uh, on professional ethics and engineering. And again, I haven't even talked about in this that, that, uh, that we have an ethical obligation to increase the diversity not only in, in gender, more women uh, uh, and more, more um, uh, minorities in the workplace and in the academia, but we have an obligation to increase diversity of thought as well. Uh, so diversity, there's a capital D, I like to think, and that is, is, is gender and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, underrepresented minorities. But there's a small d of diversity of, of different ideas coming into that, and we have to to, to think more and more about how we incorporate them into the design of our ideas, the design of our products and, and, and our research. And often, uh, traditionally, the more powerful, the more vocal a person has, has been dominant, and we have to recognize that some people that are less vocal and less dominant uh, have to be brought into the conversation and, and, and inc included as well. So that's my little, little talk. And uh, now you must have some questions or disagreements. Do you ask Professor Ru Wiener qu questions? No? No? How many of you think you're going to go into graduate school? How many want to become just to work in, in corporations? Not so many, but what about, oh, it's quite a few. And what about people doing other things like pre-law or pre, quite a few, yeah, yeah. So you can see all of the different, different. Uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity in intent even here in, in the students uh, sitting in, in here. Okay, guys, nobody's going to ask me a question.
I make my students ask questions in class. You know, I won't let them go if they don't ask me any questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. If you create something and you did the best you can as an engineer to create it, but it ends up failing anyways, and someone dies or something explodes, is that like a violation of ethics, or does that just mean you're a really bad engineer? <laughs> it's a good question. So he's saying if if you do something and invent it and you do it as hard, you try as hard as you can, and then it explodes and kills something, is it is is it unethical or are you a bad engineer? And uh, it's a difficult it's difficult to to answer that. You'd have to look at whether when you were doing this design, you were really um, going through best practices of your profession when you were doing it. So. The, you look at the original intent of the design and the way you went about it and for example if even if you were ignorant but you were using materials that that weren't strong enough uh, for example a, a pressure chamber that was badly designed so it wasn't strong enough to contain a high pressure fluid then you could say that that is that is a, a, a professional negligence that you're not you're, you're doing something and you're negligent you should have known better to do that and then I would say that you're blame blame worthy but if on the other hand you'd done all you'd done everything soundly and done all the design work well and and some an unanticipated thing had happened at the end then I don't think that you would be you would be it could be held culpable for that you would say look you know that's one of the things we've done everything that we did we protected everything as much as we could but still an unintended consequence happened and so un unintended consequences often happen in design so it's a good question that so there is there is, but there is this obligation of when you are doing a design to follow all the best practices of what you're doing all right I'm happy now that I had one question Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay.